Hello everyone, this is Freename on YouTube and it's a video about every single admin interface page of the Vodafone Power Hub as shipped to UK customers in May 2025. So the default IP address of this router is 192.168.1.1 and the password is a unique one per router on the label on the underside of the router. Once you've logged in, you get basic mode, which has a limited set of things you can click on and do. Some things are duplicated in the advanced mode, which we'll see later. The front status page has some information about what devices are connected via Ethernet, USB, whether the telephone's plugged in and what's connected to the Wi-Fi and whether your internet is working. Clicking on Wi-Fi takes you to the basic Wi-Fi settings. Clicking on USB takes you to the basic USB sharing and um, mobile dongle settings. Clicking internet on the top bar takes you to the basic internet page, which only has two options, which is firewall on and off and allow WAN ping. And the WAN ping is off by default. Clicking on Wi-Fi at the top gives you the basic Wi-Fi settings, which is turning Wi-Fi on and off and enabling the button on the router to turn Wi-Fi off and on. The Vodafone Power Hubs come with WPA3 enabled by default. This generally is poorly supported on a lot of devices, especially old Android phones and even iPhones when they're in low reception of a WPA3 enabled network. You'll often find that the wireless will drop and won't reconnect unless you go into the settings app and press on the wireless network again. So Vodafone introduced a thing called compatibility mode, which creates a second Wi-Fi name uh, which has WPA2 and only WPA2 enabled on it, which is more likely to remain connected and be more compatible with older devices. Then there's a guest Wi-Fi setting, which will be a separate Wi-Fi name you can give to your visitors and a separate password so they don't have your main Wi-Fi details. Under the WPS option, you can start pairing, uh, so you don't have to walk up to the router to start the pairing of a device if you wanted to trigger it while you're standing next to your printer, but the router's on the other side of the house or something. Uh, you can trigger it from the web interface. You can also turn WPS off and on, so if you didn't want people to be able to press the WPS button on the router to get connected, you would disable it in this screen. Moving on to the basic sharing settings, which you saw very briefly earlier when I was clicking through some things. This just has hard drives, share all as a on and off, and printers as a share toggle on and off. There are no further options on this basic settings screen. Going to the settings, you get, again, a cut down section selection of uh, options and you have changed the password to access the router's administration interface. So again, if you had people in your house uh, or visitors that could get to the router physically, you could click change password and change the uh, password back to, uh, to something which isn't on the label and on the underside of the router. Then LED settings, you can turn the lights on the hub off and on. So if this was in a bedroom and the light bothered you, you could just switch it off in software so that the light was not um, the light was not on and wouldn't uh, be visible under status and support under the basic settings or basic mode we see details about the power hub it takes a while to collect these so we'll just wait while it does so on the one that I'm testing with it isn't plugged into the internet so there are no IPv4 and other details shown for the internet port. Then you have local network, which shows IP address and um, MAC address and other things, whether the DHCP server is on, and 
what stuff is plugged into each LAN port and at what speed that LAN port is connected at. Further down, you have the Wi-Fi status. And at the very end, serial number and firmware version of the router, including memory usage and CPU usage, uptime of the router, and interestingly, the last reason it rebooted. So in this case, it's power, uh, because I think this is the first time the router had ever been plugged in. Um, but I assume if Vodafone shipped a firmware update, which caused the router to reboot, you would probably say a software upgrade or something else on the reboot cause. Moving on to the DSL status again, my one is not plugged into an active internet service, so uh, it doesn't show anything. These routers are probably going to be more commonly used on a full fiber service, um, but if they were used on a, an older phone line based service, the DSL status screen would show you the sync speed and line quality details like signal to noise ratio um, and quality of the line. Diagnostic utility screen lets you run pings and trace routes and also has an automated diagnostic tool button, which I obviously am not able to test. At the very bottom of the screen, we do have a tracing tool option, which is very unusual. That seems more like a packet capture tool. And if you plugged in a USB drive, it looks like it would save that packet capture to a USB memory stick. Automated diagnostics tool, which when you press it, will give you what seems to be a very similar um, set of information as shown on the status screen when it does the collection of uh, stuff, but this looks like it may be in a shorter format or does a slightly different set of tests. So I did plug a USB drive in, and you can tell on the admin interface that it's detected, so the uh, router knows that there's a USB drive there. However, when I went back to the um, tracing tool or the packet capture tool, it told me that I hadn't inserted a USB drive. So I couldn't get that function to work. It's possible that you may need to turn off the USB sharing for it to be able to write to the USB stick. Um, it wasn't really something that was particularly important for me to investigate. Moving on to the reconnect option, which basically just seems like on the DSL, you can possibly cause it to retrain uh, the line. So disconnect the DSL uh, physical layer and then reconnect. And uh, on the fiber one, it would probably just drop the PPP connection and, uh, and reconnect might bring the US, uh, it may bring the ethernet port down and up um, as well, but uh, it basically reconnects the uh, connections. On the about page, it basically tells you all of the free and open source bits of software that they use within the router firmware. We'll go back to the home page and then select expert mode. It doesn't really change anything on the first status page, but when you click on internet, you suddenly have a huge number of extra options on the left side. So instead of just having the allow ping on WAM, and the firewall option, we also have IPv4 port mapping, IPv6 settings and other things on the left. So moving on and looking at the port mapping, which is port forwarding, and this is going to be an example of how to add a port forward. Click on the plus, type in the name of the service, which is just a friendly name for you to know what it is in the future. So I'm using web server. I know it's going to be on TCP and it's going to be on this IP address is where I'm running my web server. And then I'm going to do port 443 for HTTPS. And I'm also going to add port 80, which is the non-secure uh, web. then you do need to scroll down and select save or apply. Moving on to the IPv6 settings, it's pinholes, which is the equivalent of port forwarding, uh, but there isn't 
NAT translation on IPv6. So the router will just block any inbound stuff that isn't configured. If you wanted to allow a service inbound, you would need to use this screen. Then we move on to DMZ, which if you are told to use DMZ and you do not know why, then somebody's probably giving you the wrong advice. You want to try and exhaust IPv4 port mapping before you use DMZ. DMZ is basically opening up a device to the internet entirely, every single port, every single service, every single bit of software which is running on that machine, potentially accessible on the internet. Um, it's often game uh, port forwarding advice tells you, oh, use DMZ through to your Xbox or to your PC. Um, what you really should be doing, rather than using DMZ, is finding the instructions on exactly which ports do need to be forwarded, rather than just blanket forwarding every single uh, port through to your device. Moving on to DNS and DDNS, you can set custom DNS servers. And also the router supports dynamic DNS through several different providers. DynDNS, which is not free. No-IP, which is free. Change IP, which is free. Uh, Dyn.com and EasyDNS and ZoneEdit, I don't know anything about. But uh, this would mean that if you are on a dynamic IP address with Vodafone, your host name, for example, uh, bobshouse.no-ip.com, would always follow your dynamic IP address. So um, you could sit in somebody else's house and, for example, access your CCTV uh, hard disk recorder by accessing the host name rather than having to know your IP address uh, every time it changes. Moving on to the mobile data 3G slash 4G. This, I assume, is if you use the USB socket on the back and plug in a mobile broadband dongle. Um, I do not have one to plug in and test, but hopefully if anyone needs it, um, that's what the screen looks like. Now going on to Wi-Fi, and this is the bit where we're in the expert mode, so we will get more options on this screen. The first screen doesn't give you anything additional, but there are further options on the left side. WPS screen is the same, and then we move on to Wi-Fi settings, which is a new screen in the expert mode. So what you get here, you can change the Wi-Fi mode, which there should really be no reason to change um, because most stuff is compatible with what is already set in the defaults there. Then you have bandwidth, um, which most of the time, again, you'd probably just want to leave on default as the highest uh, channel megahertz bandwidth. If you're in somewhere where you want to have a lot of access points doing a lot of bandwidth, um, concurrently near each other, you may wish to reduce the channel width um, so that you can have more access points in a small area uh, without them interfering as much. Periodic auto scan probably sets how often it might update its Wi Fi channel. So um, if the channel is set to auto, then every so often it, the router will need to scan the local airwaves to see whether it's on the, the most efficient or effective channel um, and that auto scan uh, could be an option you want to turn off because depending how the router is designed and I haven't tested this uh, it may temporarily pause data um, when it does its scan um, because you can't have clients connected to its radio while its radio is hopping through the other channels to check for interference. It might be a very brief drop, but if you're in a game or a um, online call or something, that may not be something you want to happen. Moving on to Analyzer on the left side. This is the scan that your router will be doing if it's in auto mode, but the Analyzer will let you see it uh, rather than it just doing it automatically in the background. For me, it never came up with any results. It just sat there 
always saying, please wait, refreshing results. However, upon reloading the page, it did come up with some graphs of the channel usage. And the same when clicking 5 gigahertz, I didn't even need to click on refresh, it just had the results there. Moving on to client monitoring, I didn't have any wirelessly connected devices, so I couldn't test that section. Going to sharing under the expert mode, we have sliders for hard disks and printers, and then also the ways it can share those under sharing settings. Under settings, we can check for a firmware update change the LEDs to be on or off and under configuration we can back up and restore the settings that we have in the router we can also remotely reboot the router and factory reset it weirdly in this screen is where you'll find the UPnP which to my surprise is switched off by default and also has device fingerprinting where it sends some information about your connected devices off to a third party to identify what they are under public subnet, you probably would need a Vodafone business service to use that. And under local networks, where you would change the LAN IP address and DHCP server details on the router. This is also where you can turn off and on IPv6. Interestingly, it defaults to a lease time of forever. So if you never rebooted your device, presumably eventually it would run out of IP addresses or maybe it would eventually start reusing IP addresses. Under the static DHCP v4, uh, you can set an IP address that you, one of your devices or several of your devices will always be given. Under status and support, under the expert settings, you've got DSL stats, fiber status, mobile status which will show you the signal levels of uh, the dongle if you have one to plug into the router moving on to the NAT mapping table it will give you a download of I think all of the active connections uh, so stuff flowing through the firewall so this is basically the TCP and UDP sessions and source addresses, destination addresses, source ports, destination ports, and uh, what state the router thinks the connection is in. This is actually quite a powerful um, set of information and unusual for a consumer router to allow you to download it. Diagnostic utility we've been through in the basic settings. Event log shows you details about things that are happening on the router. I'm just going to have a scroll down this list. If you do want to read it, then please pause the video. Uh, otherwise, if you just skip ahead, probably about 30 seconds, it will be past that. We've been through the reconnect screen on the basics screen and then the final bit is the about which is just going to be the same as on basic so hopefully this video has been helpful to you if it has it would be really helpful to me if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my youtube channel you don't need to have the video notifications on but the subscriber numbers really do help so thank you very much